Our first speaker today is Philip Jenkins, who will speak on Christendom's last holy war, the First World War as a Religious Crusade. Professor Jenkins has published 25 books, which have been translated into 16 languages. His book, The Great and Holy War, How World War I Became a Religious Crusade, offers the first look at how religion created and prolonged the First World War. Professor Jen Jenkins is a distinguished professor of history at Baylor University and serves as co-director for the programs on the historical studies of religion in the Institute for the Studies for Studies of Religion at Baylor University. He received his doctorate from Cambridge University. He's one of the world's leading religion scholars, and his work has been lauded in many different disciplines, including sociology, criminology, and religious studies. His research includes interests in the study of global Christianity, past and present, new and emerging religious movements, and the 20th century U.S. history, particularly post-1975. We are so glad to have Professor Jenkins with us this morning. Please welcome him. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful uh, welcome. We've received nothing but um, uh, hospitality uh, here, uh, even from the uh, driver of the car rental shuttle who asked where we were from, and we said uh, Waco, and he said, I don't reckon much to Texas. Uh, but uh, uh, other than that, it's, uh, it's been excellent. Um, when you hear that idea of uh, the First World War as a holy war, as a crusade, it, uh, it obviously sounds almost like a, um, a bad joke. This was a war that uh, killed 10 million people uh, on the battlefield. It led to a series of disasters and plagues that probably killed another maybe 50 million. What could be holy? What could be a crusade here? But uh, I need to run against the current here. And I'm going to begin by um, telling you a, uh, a story. And if you look at this uh, picture, you'll see one of the most famous uh, stories of the war. Uh, this is something that uh, happened in 1914. And you'll see that it is a British uh, soldier being guarded by angels. And there's an interesting uh, history to this. In, um, in 1914, there was a, uh, a battle at uh, uh, Mons where a, an outnumbered British force uh, held off uh, for a crucial uh, time uh, a much larger uh, German force. It was a heroic event uh, in its own right, but immediately afterwards, a British uh, author called uh, Arthur Machen wrote a very short story in a newspaper and it's what we would call a fantasy story. And he imagines the soldiers at Mons, and uh, they know they're about to die. And one of them says, jokingly, well, God and St. George, save us now. And he finds that he's accidentally raised the spirits of English archers from the Middle Ages who were buried there. And they rise to defend the modern-day British army, and they fight off the Germans. And that story is called The Bowmen. It's a, it's a nice story. And shortly afterwards, uh, Machen made an interesting discovery. He kept meeting people who'd been at the battle and seen The Bowmen. And when he said, no, excuse me, I made it up, the response says, well, no, you didn't. My, my brother was there. He saw the arrow wounds in the Germans. And this becomes a little kind of frustrating. Um, and that story goes on to become one of the most repeated stories of the war. People still, if you go on the internet, people still believe it today. And it morphs over time from being about bowmen to being about angels, the angel of Mons. There are uh, orchestral pieces, the angel of Mons. There are paintings. What I want to suggest is this. Government, media, churches, armies create stories, undoubtedly. They create propaganda. But there is no way that propaganda could have been effective did it not speak to an audience that already wanted to believe these stories. 
And when you look at the stories surrounding the First World War, you realize that there are so many examples of, not just of supernatural ideas, but certain key themes. Angels, the apocalypse, Armageddon. Let me, I suppose, begin by uh, presenting a stereotype. Here's a stereotype, and this is what, what we should logically believe. Here's the stereotype. Uh, when war breaks out, Government propaganda goes into overdrive. It uh, presents all these uh, powerful uh, stories about um, holy war, about Armageddon, in a way of getting these ordinary soldiers to go off and fight. They don't really believe it. It's very cynical, uh, but but uh, but it works. It gets people into their uh, into their uniforms. After a while, uh, the soldiers realize just how hollow the pretense is. They see the uh, dreadful battles, the dreadful violence they're facing. They become disenchanted. And that disenchantment then spreads after the war and basically cripples religion, not just Christianity, uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. In a sense, that is the end of Christendom. I think I'm right in saying that's a pretty common interpretation. I want to suggest that's wrong. I want to suggest that unless you take account of very seriously held, honestly held beliefs at all levels of society, it is very hard to determine why the war actually happened, why people fought, and also, critically, why they sustained that belief. It is not the case that in 1914 everyone goes into this war frenzy and speaks of holy war, but they pretty soon forget it. The religious elements of the war grow during the war, and they reach a climax in 1917 and 1918. And that religious movement has its great impact after uh, the war. Now, um, I, I can talk about this at any, any number of uh, levels, but let me suggest, if you want to look at why did the nations fight? Well, there were any number of um, conflicts over economic interests, territorial interests. We've got a bigger navy than you've got, and all these, um, uh, uh, all these issues. But if you look at the key players in the war, they are very strongly motivated by ideologies that are religious and supernatural. That is most strongly evident in the case of, um, of Germany, where for 40 years the dominant Protestant church has presented a very strongly religious nationalist ideology that presents the Kaiser's government as literally being the seed of a coming kingdom of God in Europe, of being a messianic state, a messianic kingdom. And that message is presented week by week in, uh, every, uh, in every Protestant pulpit in, uh, in Germany. That, in turn, sets a very high bar for other religious organizations who can't, be, who can't let the Protestants beat them. So Catholics then develop a strong Holy War ideology. And interestingly, German Jews become some of the most fervent exponents of this um, ideology of Germany being a holy kingdom engaged in a holy war. So Germany is a holy kingdom, and Russia is also a holy kingdom. Russia is uh, a, a completely fused uh, church and state. It has this messianic, apocalyptic vision at the heart of its official ideology that also takes account of a lot of texts that we've forgotten. If you look at Russian intellectuals around uh, 1914, then the texts they're reading are things like the Apocalypse of Daniel. Do not go looking in your Bible for the Apocalypse of Daniel. It's an apocryphal work that circulated separately, and it describes how a new Constantine, a new Roman emperor, will arise, will conquer the Muslims, will dominate and restore the old Roman and Byzantine empire, and there's no doubt among Russian elites that this is what is going to happen in their lifetime. I don't know how many of you um, have ever seen plays or films about uh, the outbreak of World War I, and you see something in what we might call a, uh, like a Downton Abbey setting where uh, somebody comes in with a message and saying, oh, an archduke has been assassinated. Well, no problem there. And you know something horrible is going to happen. 
And the suggestion is that the war comes literally out of a clear blue sky. The myth of the summer of 1914 is very strong. I just want to point out that is absolutely incorrect in the sense that for the five years before 1914, if you are a European intellectual, you are immersed in apocalyptic speculation. This is what the books, this is what the novels, this is what the paintings are all about. And if you are a German intellectual, an Austrian intellectual, a Russian intellectual, and you are in your 20s, you know war is coming, you know it's going to be the, uh, the apocalypse, and you know that you're going to be hearing the hooves of the apocalyptic horsemen and the wings of angels very soon. That language is so strong. How much of it is a metaphor? I never know. Part of it's a mistranslation thing. One of the great artistic schools in Europe at this point is called the Blue Rider. And it's this very experimental art and it brings in Germans and Austrians and Russians. It's not a Blue Rider. It's Blau Reiter, horsemen. And they're hearing the horsemen of the uh, apocalypse. What I'm suggesting is that from all sorts of different points of view, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, there is an expectation of apocalyptic change. And when, it finally, in 1914, war breaks out, and it is so, and I'm trying to avoid overusing the word, so apocalyptic, this is precisely what they expect. And the language of Armageddon becomes uh, absolutely standard, absolutely mainstream. Um, the question then is how many people believe that? Well, at the level of elites, it's very strong indeed. They don't just say, well, let, let's present this propaganda as a way of drafting foot soldiers. They believe it. The uh, German commander on the uh, invasion of France is uh, uh, Helmut von Molke. And uh, Helmut von Molke has in his possession, has in his uniform, um, uh, many um, mantras and sayings predicting the glorious future of Germany that have been given to him, that have been channeled for him by Europe's greatest mystic and medium, Rudolf Steiner. Um, uh, General uh, von Molke dies in 1916, and his role in public affairs increases dramatically after that because Steiner spends the next two years channeling in a mediumistic way what General von Molke is saying from the beyond and distributing that to every author and general and commander in Germany. Uh, he has a, if you like, a mighty uh, post, uh, uh, post-mortem um, influence. And across the board, you see th um, this language, and you begin to think that elites are taking it very seriously. There's a famous uh, French author uh, called Céline, and he writes a book called uh, Journey to the End of Night. And uh, Céline is a very, uh, what shall I say, a very cynical character, and so he joins the, uh, the army and is very likely to be, uh, be killed. But he's absolutely shocked to find how many of the people surrounding him have got completely religious ideologies. This is in France, which is a secular, republican country where religion is strongly discouraged. And he has one line, uh, dis uh, decisively, I realized I had joined an apocalyptic crusade. And wherever we go in the war, we find this language, and we find an interesting phenomenon which runs contrary to the stereotype. We find that far from trying to encourage these, what should we call them, superstitious ideas, governments are working very hard to suppress them. Why are they doing that? Well, think about it. Apocalyptic is very good because it means that the angels are going to intervene on the side of the forces of good. But people have got a bad idea of believing that uh, the angels are going to intervene and destroy all governments, including ours. So governments aren't too uh, fond of that. The other one is many of the European governments, the British, the French, the uh, uh, Italians, the Russians, have got large Muslim populations. They don't want any talk of crusade. 
And uh, the, the British, for example, issue uh, w w uh, security notices, censorship notices, saying we don't want anyone using the phrase crusade. You can go to prison for this. And that works abominably badly. Nobody pays attention. And throughout this, we get the language of what? Angels, apocalyptic uh, crusade. You know, um, so much of our image of the First World War is formed from the writing of intellectuals and a fairly select band of uh, intellectuals, like in English, who do you have? Robert Graves, Siegfried Sassoon, Wilf uh, Wilfred Owen, who are writing, um, uh, uh, Owen, of course, is killed, um, in a more cynical mood after the war. During the war, people tend to believe these religious ideas much more than we may think. If you ever want to uh, uh, read this, there's a, um, uh, th there's a wonderful uh, Swiss author by the name of Hans Berthold, and Hans Berthold carried out an ethnography, uh, like a social survey, of German and Austrian soldiers in the war in 1915. And I stress that because when you read it, you have to keep looking back to see he isn't talking about 1615. Because if you look at the ideas that people have the rituals they go through, the little uh, symbolic figures and idols and saints that they have in the trenches, you think you're back in the 17th century. They, uh, they or their uh, wives and uh, kids back home are doing magic spells to keep them safe. They're using amulets. And you think, when the armies that go to war in 1914 are not made up of poets and intellectuals, largely, they made up of peasants, and peasants who are very used to accepting ideas of angels and the virgin. Let me illustrate a couple of these ideas. Imagine a world where you have these very kind of supernatural ideas, and then you have these monstrous, inconceivable images of war and, um, and destruction. You know, we today, interesting how language has changed. We today look at these, and we think, well, these look like they're out of science fiction. Back in 1914, they don't talk about them as science fiction. They talk about them as being out of the apocalypse. They talk about them in the sense of, um, of religious language. Throughout the war, you get the image of crucifixion and crucifixes. This is a very famous one, a uh, famous image. Um, much of the war on the Western Front takes place in a highly Catholic area of northern France and Belgium. Every village has its crucifix, its shrine. During the war, many of those crucifixes and shrines are destroyed utterly, but some of them survive partially to make it look as if Christ is on the battlefield. And we get the creation of a world of um, shrines and devotions uh, uh, through the war. If you imagine the, uh, the trenches of the very secular French or the very secular Italians, um, wh when we map trenches, as we often do, we show there's a machine gun post here and there's a backup line here, we always forget one thing, which is they've got shrines of the Virgin at set distances. This is an extremely religious war where people are, as, as is sometimes said, are prepared to believe absolutely anything except what is passed on from the higher command. And this is, uh, this is typical. This is the uh, uh, interesting difference from the Second World War, a fundamental difference. Christ makes many appearances in First World War uh, symbolism, not just as, if you like, a disembodied hand or a disembodied voice, but Christ. This is Christ uh, blessing German forces, and the uh, prayer uh, at the bottom is, um, uh, uh, Lord, uh, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the, uh, the German forces are going to uh, institute this, uh, Christ and the destruction of uh, crucifixes. And, you know, this is, uh, this is something, this is somebody I'm going to be talking about quite a lot. This is the, uh, the archangel Michael, who I always say is one of the... Um, insufficiently heralded stars of the First World War. Let me explain that. In 1813, there was a great battle in which the Allied nations led by Germany defeated Napoleon. 
at a great battle near Leipzig in Germany uh, called the Battle of the Nations. Centennial, 1913, Germany built a memorial to that battle. And if you want to understand German national ideology in the First World War and the Second World War, go to that monument. And everywhere you will see the imagery of, uh, of pagan heroes, of, um, but also of Christian angels and archangels depicted as almost symbolic warlords of the German army. Michael runs through the war. In 1918, in the spring of 1918, when the German forces launched their great uh, final throw to try and defeat the Allies before the Americans can get in, what is it called? Obviously, Operation Michael. Michael is everywhere in the war. There, there was, um, there's a wonderful book you can read by a woman who was a nurse uh, in the war. Called, uh, it's called Testament of Youth by Vera Britton. And Vera Britton, by 1918, was probably the only cynic left on the Western Front. And she has this passage, and she, everyone, she, every British soldier she talks to is absolutely convinced that A, this is a holy war, B, that all the soldiers who have been killed in the war so far are actually walking, marching with them, that there are ghost armies and ghost legions going with them to fight the Germans, and also that angels are leading them. And I don't know if you're familiar with this concept. You've heard of folk tales, right? There's also stories that are told to you by a friend of a friend, F-O-A-F, that are called folk tales. She knows so many folk tales. Every soldier in her care says, yes, well, our, our colonel there was killed two years ago, but he came back to fight with us. And uh, she has this despairing fantasy, which is, well, just suppose the Angel of Mons was fighting on our side, and Michael was fighting on the German side, and they both went out uh, into uh, no man's land to duke it out. Who would win? And she didn't believe it, but probably if she'd raised it with her soldiers, they'd have said, yeah, that's an interesting question. Angels are everywhere. The language of crusade is very strong. And you might be saying, well, you know, you have crusades that are so described, and not every soldier believes in them. I wonder in the medieval crusades if every soldier believed that they actually were fighting for, um, fighting for the kingdom of God, that they were fighting for Christ, or if they were just doing something different, doing something because they'd been told, uh, uh, told to fight. Whenever you see uh, Austrian or German uh, propaganda, you get these knightly medieval uh, images which are, which are so strong. I always like that one. This is, uh, this is not actually an angel. This is more of a Valkyrie. This is the spirit of Germany in August 1914. I always like that. That is a terrifying lady. Uh... But the way in which people portray the country... We sometimes think, uh, you know, we today live in the great age of mass media. Please remember, in the First World War in 1914, this is already an age of global media. When something happens, when a story happens like the Angel of Mons, it reaches every corner of the British Empire, of the French Empire. It is translated around the world. Some of the most powerful images of sacrifice angels, apocalyptic, are transmitted through film. And they have a great advantage. These are silent films. They can be shown anywhere. Um, oh, yeah. Everywhere you go, you get images of, um, of George and, um, and the dragon. Uh, yeah, a, a, a George is a very uh, polyfaceted uh, figure. And then the Americans join in 1917. And it's interesting. Um, America is uh, notionally uh, a secular constitution. Try sell, uh, telling that to every minister, it seems, every clergyman in America in 1917 who adopts the language of holy war, of crusade, at a much higher level than the Germans or the British or the Russians had used in 1914. And I think there's a reason for that, because by this point, America has been so swept by particularly allied propaganda, they know it's a holy war, and they are aching to fight in it. And some of the, uh, the language that they use, some of the uh, discussion, 
is, it, it strikes us as, um, as grotesque. So there is actually, uh, there are two debates I find interesting. One is, if, you, you, I'm sure you know, all know what would Jesus do, well, they have a big debate in what Jesus would do. A, we know he'd fight on the front, but would he use the bayonet? <laughs> this, is very, um, th this is very serious, and there's a sizable um, coalition of clergy who say undoubtedly yes, because that is the only way to destroy the, uh, the satanic evil that is, um, that is Germany. Oh. One thing I do find interesting there, the clergy who have the most high-flown, advanced views of holy war and crusade, they have one thing in common. The clergy who were the most progressive, social gospel, reformers, all the main liberal clergy before the war, including Quakers and Unitarians, are the most fervent crusaders in 1917. It's not just the Episcopalians who, are, uh, who might be expected to be pro-British, but it's people who are often from German churches. And as I say, the language is very consistent and, um, and very strong. And it's interesting, this is an official um, American publicity uh, poster, um, which I believe is, yes, the first official American war picture is about Pershing's Crusaders. It is a crusade. Oh, I said there were two issues. One is, would, would Jesus use the, uh, the bayonet? What would Jesus, who would Jesus kill? The uh, other part of it is, if an allied soldier is killed in combat, does he automatically qualify for heaven? And again, there's a lot of debate, and there are many evangelicals who say, well, this really gets into some serious issues of Christian theology. And they issue very tentative pamphlets saying, we really would rather you didn't say this, but a lot of clergy do say it. They use a, what would we call it today? A jihadi ideology. They speak the language of holy war, holy death, and martyrdom. Uh, but I, I do uh, commend that to you. Oh, by the way, and if you, you want to put this in context, Please remember how much the language of knighthood, the cross, the crusade is around at this time. What happens in 1915 is the formation of the second Ku Klux Klan and all its images, they're all, of course, uh, uh, taken from the film Birth of the Nation, are of knights on horseback with red crosses. That is such a powerful archetype at that point. Oh, yeah. This is one I find very interesting. Um, I came across this, and nobody who was uh, uh, selling it had a clue what it was, and they knew it was some kind of propaganda thing. Allow me to help you. Uh, this is a Russian card, and it represents the enemy forces of, um, of Germany and, um, and Austria. Um, and you will notice, well, let's see, Germany, Austria, Hungary. Well, how many is that? And the answer is seven, because we have to have, in the apocalypse, a beast of seven heads. And they get that by having the king of Germany, but also including the remaining sub-kings, like the king of Bavaria and the king of Saxony, and come on, work, we have to get to seven, but they eventually do. <laughs> what are they fighting? They're fighting satanic, apocalyptic evil. And here's an interesting issue for you. If we are Christian, whoever we are, and the enemy is Christian, how do we fight a crusade against them? And how we do it is by showing that although they claim to be Christian, they're really not. They're really satanic. And on both sides, there is a huge literature um, proving that whatever the enemy claims, they are not really Christian. For instance, in 1914, the Germans initially worked very hard to say, the British, the French, they claim to be Christian. But what they're actually doing is they're bringing in all these hundreds of thousands of Muslim and Hindu soldiers into Europe to fight Christians. They are, they are absolute fakes. They're, they're not Christian at all. And that propaganda theme lasts precisely until Germany forms an alliance with Ottoman Turkey. And then there's a collective, never mind. 
But the other thing they do is war propaganda to show that the enemy is not just bad, not just out of control, but actively satanic. A couple of shocking images uh, follow. This is from George Bellows, who's probably the greatest American painter of the age. He did a series of basically why, why, why we fight paintings. And what you see here is this supposedly was an incident in Belgium where there were many grave German atrocities where the German soldiers are using the bodies of Belgian civilians as, uh, as bodyguards. You get all the stories of the, uh, the mutilation of um, Belgians, of people in occupied countries, of, um, of mass uh, rape. And this exists on uh, both sides. Um, and of course, we, we have to make fun of the enemy's claim to be Christian. So there we have a nativity scene with the kings of um, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, and they're bringing useful shells and uh, useful things for the, uh, the newborn. It's a, um, it's a parody of their Christianity. This is a classic story. Allegedly, allegedly, and by the way, this is one of the most important stories I will tell you. In 1915, there was a story that the Germans had captured a Canadian officer at the battlefront, and they had crucified him in front of his horrified fellow soldiers on the other side of the line. That story, as we say, goes global. That is a still from a film which shows the story of the crucified Canadian. And th that theme runs through sculpture. It becomes like a national uh, story. Why am I saying that's so important? Because after the war, people felt very widely, hey, that was a bogus atrocity story. We don't believe any of this nonsense anymore. Um, don't try and fool us with that again. Move the film forward to 1942, where people come and say, we have evidence. The Germans are rounding up hundreds of thousands of Jews in Europe. They're putting them in camps and gassing them. And what a number of politicians and media people say in the West is, oh yeah, is this another crucified Canadian? And one reason they are slow to believe the stories in 1942 is they think they don't want to get fooled again. Oh, and one little footnote, we now know that the crucified Canadian story was actually true. Um, that is from a poster, talk about global. Uh, it's buying liberty bonds, why is it in Spanish? Because it's a poster intended to raise support in the Philippines. We often forget how global this war was. I'm sure some of my colleagues here are going to be talking about this. How global was it? The British used the Japanese Navy to protect the shores of Western Canada. Some of the key naval battles in the war were fought off the coast of, uh, of Chile and um, Argentina. There are battles in China. There are battles in Africa. This is the Philippines. What is it? It's a story of crucifixion. This is a beauty. If you want to attract, and this is going to sound very cynical, but if you want to attract attention, not just to use an image of uh, blood, but if you can, use, if you can fit uh, a, a scantily clad woman into the picture, and so many of the images are like this, what is wrong with the Germans? They crucify. It is a call to honor American manhood. Enlist. You're dealing with a world where even if people are not actively Christian, I'm talking of overwhelmingly Christian societies, they are absolutely soaked in what is sometimes called diffusive Christianity. They know the idea of sacrifice. They know the idea of crucifixion. They have some knowledge of the Bible, even if they only know it to quote it uh, in mockery. the idea of um, sacrifice. If you are appealing to a kind of diffusive Christianity, uh, you, you do it by using this kind of um, imagery. Um, and the language that emerges uh, in the war, and again, I stress on all sides, if I was just talking about the British or the Americans, this would be very partial, very inaccurate, um, on all sides. Uh, and some of the language that uh, emerges, it, it, it reads so painfully in uh, re retrospect. Some of the, um, probably some of the worst military commanders of the war were uh, in the Italian army. 
and they had a very bad habit of sending basically human wave assaults against well-fortified Austrian and German positions. How did they justify that? They used a phrase, necessary holocausts, and they used the language of holocaust, sacrifice. In other words, we must sacrifice in order to win victory. And that sacrificial ideology emerges in many of the attempts to justify what to us look like some of the suicidal and, dare I say, stupid acts of the war. Angels are everywhere in the war. Angels have many kind of characteristics. There are what you might call hallmark angels, but angels are also integral to the whole story of um, Revelation, of the apocalypse. The fact that angel wings are around us means that we are close to um, the, the, uh, the end times. When soldiers die, you know, here's a, basically a greeting card um, and uh, c commemorating a, a death. There are, uh, there are angels. Um, you have uh, uh, British um, soldiers being uh, suckered by these uh, nurses. And behind them, what do you have? A crusader with a cross. Oh, every army has reports of visions. And did the people themselves see visions? No, but a um, friend of a friend uh, told me about it. Commonly the Virgin, often Joan of Arc. The French did a very interesting range of posters, basically um, having Joan of Arc appear and explain why uh, she uh, was no longer mad that the British had burnt her, and they were now on the same side, honestly. So this is Joan of Arc uh, uh, leading the British. He's very broad-minded. This, um, this is the Russian icon showing the appearance at um, Augustovo. Was any country more or less holy war-oriented than any others? I would put the Germans and the Russians at the top, but the Americans are very, very close indeed. And in every country, even when governments do not accept the ideology, there are clearly mass movements that are trying to push for a more um, religious orientation. So for example, in France, which is as secular as you get, they have the tricolor, they have the red, uh, white, and blue, and there's a mass movement in the war uh, to make sure you have the figure of the sacred heart restored to the tricolor. The government says no, but millions of French women spend the war sewing sacred hearts onto French flags and sending them to their uh, sons in uh, battle. Our Lady of the Trenches, um, oh yeah, and uh, Christ is everywhere. This is uh, actually a very nice uh, journey to Emmaus one, um, and it's a, a Easter dawn, and it's two soldiers with, uh, with Christ behind them. I'll go through this very quickly. It's kind of a lengthy story, but you, everywhere you go in the war, you get images of Christ appearing to um, German forces, Russian forces, British forces, which, dare I say, he wouldn't do if their cause was not the holy cause. This is the last march. This is Christ gathering up the, uh, the souls of the German dead and taking them to uh, heaven. I told the story of the uh, Angel of Mons. This is uh, uh, an interesting uh, version, uh, alternative to that. There was a moment in uh, 1915, where we had a heavily outnumbered French force. Uh, it was facing destruction from the Germans, and a, uh, an officer said, uh, uh, basically, uh, may the dead arise, debout les morts. And that meant, if I don't care how badly wounded you are, pick up a rifle and come fight. And the story got told, and told, and retold. And in about three tellings, it was, and the officer said, de les morts. And the souls and spirits of the dead French soldiers came to fight, and they took weapons, and they defeated the Germans. And that story continues as an ideology of radical nationalism for the French, for the Germans, in all European countries, really, through the, uh, through the 20s um, and 30s. It's a very supernatural idea. That's the most famous British soldier of the war, Raymond Lodge. You've never heard of Raymond Lodge? Raymond Lodge was killed in 1915. Between 1915 and 1918, his father undertook a series of seances 
in which Raymond passed on many messages about the war and the, uh, the, the afterlife. His dad was England's probably best-known scientist of the time, a man called Sir Oliver Lodge, one of the pioneers of electromagnetism. And that book was probably the British bestseller of, of the First World War. All the way through the 19-teens and 20s, the churches are struggling desperately to take account of this mediumistic, spiritualist world. Here's Rudolf Steiner, uh, enormously influential in the German uh, mystical world. Um, and as I say, he, uh, he's the one who supplies these messages from the beyond. He supplies um, mantras, he supplies uh, sacred texts, meditative texts for leading uh, generals and politicians. Uh, he has a very substantial role in actually military policy making. We come to 1917. In theory, you remember I said the stereotype, you have all these religious ideas and the soldiers go off to the front and pretty much realize, well, that was nonsense. Let's see if we can get out of here alive. Well, no. By 1917, the world believes that um, the war has gone on far longer than it should have done. Uh, many nations are starving. Many nations face disaster. We know that uh, there are bloodier and bloodier um, battles afoot. And in 1917, apocalyptic expectation reaches a height. It has many... Um, uh, aspects. One of the great stories happens in um, Fatima in Portugal, where a couple of peasant children claim to have had a, story, uh, a vision of the Virgin Mary. Um, Portugal at that time is very divided between very strongly Catholic people and people who are very strongly anti-religious, and hundreds of thousands of both sides go off to see the next promised vision. And the, uh, you know, the secularists are there with popcorn and they're ready to uh, you know, write dreadful things. And then something happens that we still don't know. What happened? But according to most of the people there, the sun did something odd. What they actually say was, well, the sun came out of the heavens, did a pirouette, and we thought it was going to crash down on Earth. If you have an explanation on this, please send it immediately to the Portuguese government. They're still trying to figure it out. But the, the vision of Fatima basically sends a message that the end times are near. And Catholics, of course, still celebrate, commemorate the miracle of uh, Fatima, which, of course, is preceded in a vision from, you probably figured it out by now, the Archangel Michael. Um, in the fall of 1917, we have the 400th anniversary of uh, Luther beginning the Reformation. There's a great Luther celebration in Wittenberg in uh, Germany, good German Protestants, Lutherans, they're not going to be fooled by visions of the Virgin, and they launch it into a great celebration of the coming of the German Messiah, Martin Luther. And it is a very messianic uh, occasion. It is also, by the way, the first time within the Lutheran church that you get people actively campaigning for a radical separation between Jews and people of Jewish descent and Christians in the church, and even the suppression of the Old Testament as a Jewish testament. It shows how radically people believe at this time. Okay, I told you that the, um, the British and the French are trying very hard to prevent their war in the Middle East being called a crusade. Nobody calls it a crusade. Well, there's a picture of a uh, British soldier being represented in a cartoon at the time, sort of as a would-be crusader. In 1917, British and uh, Imperial forces are advancing fast on Jerusalem. And the British government is agonizing over what to do if, God forbid, they actually take it. Because if they actually take it, it's going to send off these messianic, uh, crusading ideas around the world. And so the khaki crusaders, good luck. Uh, and so the general, Alan B., works very hard to say, well, we're going to take the city, but please, let's not do it in any way that's going to send a crusading message. So he looks in his calendar, is it any kind of symbolic date? No, we can do it safely. Okay, but let's be very respectful. We take Jerusalem. I will walk in, not riding a horse, to show my humility. We don't want anything grand. What's the one mistake he makes? He asks every Christian for special dates, but doesn't bother to ask the Jews. 
and he takes Jerusalem on Hanukkah. <laughs> and that is a, a, a card at the time which, you know, says it all. Here's Allenby trying to be modest and not a crusader, and they will come for Zion, a redeemer. It's comparing Allenby to Judas Maccabeus. You see President Wilson uh, up above, and you'll see a Zionist uh, flag uh, up above there. That is so influential worldwide, it sets off apocalyptic end times uh, expectation. Does that have a practical consequence? Oh yeah, the British government at this point is loaded with very evangelical people, and it's round about this time that they say, well, it's time for the Jews to return to Jerusalem, that they issue the Balfour Declaration, that mean that is the foundation of the state of Israel. I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm certainly not going to uh, go for uh, much longer in case people are, um, are panicking, but let me uh, move on to a couple of, just a couple of points very quickly. That bizarre picture, 1918, where we've had um, famine, death, and war. What is the other horseman? Plague. The war kills 10 million people. The influenza epidemic of 1918 kills probably between 50 and 100 million people. If you don't believe the apocalypse is nigh by this point, you have not been reading the news. Um, and expectations uh, run very high. This is reflected very strongly in so many of the films that go around the world. And if you want to understand what ordinary people believed, ordinary people thought about the war, look at films. I'll describe three very quickly. Civilization by Thomas Ince is about a, um, a German soldier, oh, excuse me, it's a, it's a kingdom that is not named, but has uh, the main char character is called Ferdinand, and its ruler is a, um, the mirror image of the Kaiser. Um, Ferdinand is executed for refusing to commit atrocities, and he returns as Christ, and Christ in a film one of the biggest Hollywood films ever, leads the Kaiser through the battlefield to show him the atrocities he's committed. Intolerance is the great D.W. Griffith film, which is about various aspects of violence and conflict in history, which culminates with an image of the armies fighting on either side of the Western Front until angels appear in the sky and bring in the end times. And the third film, the most popular film, the biggest budget film of the era, the Star Wars of its day, which of course was called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Best-selling book of the war was The Be uh, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. This is the film. If you ever watch it these days, it actually has the four horsemen regularly riding over the battles. It has the great beast. It has people reading the scriptures. That was the biggest film ever made up to that point, the most profitable, made a star of uh, Rudolf uh, Valentino, and all we remember it for today is that it made a hit of the tango. There was more to it than the tango. I can, uh, I can talk about this at great length. I could write a book about it. Oh, yeah, I did. Um, but my point is this. When you look at the First World War, it is very easy to look at these claims about angels, apocalypse, Armageddon, Holy War, Crusade, as if they are empty propaganda that is imposed from above. Governments spend far more time trying to stop people believing in that than they do trying to start them believing in that. At all levels of society, you have very intense religious belief, often of an extremely unconventional character. Um, and, as I say, illustrate that at any different uh, number of um, levels. Final question. You fight a holy war, and there are two things you can do that are very bad. One is win it, because if you win a holy war, how come everything isn't perfect? And losing a holy war. And if you lose a holy war, that means you did something wrong. Maybe we failed to take account of the traitors in our midst. And when we fight it next time, we're not going to make that mistake again. And if you want to understand European politics from the 1920s and 1930s, remember, this is after a failed holy war and crusade. Thank you very much.